So it's all about consciousness expressing through relationship. Does this relate to the Ganesh particle or Ganesh phenomena that Dan Burst was working on? I'm not familiar with that. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, that was my big question. It sounds like Dan Burst and the Ganesh phenomena. What I'm finding, and thank you for bringing it up, because I'll look it up, is that as I'm presenting this pure gearheady stuff, because I'm not well read, there are all these people coming up saying, this connects to this, connects to this. And, and it's been beautiful, because maybe it's a kind of a unification of things. Mm -hmm. All right. There's more on that when you, when you get there. More on that at lunch. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, First thing I want to say is I just am um, struck by the amount of gratitude I have for people like you and people that have committed a life to this and been able to share this kind of information with us. It means a lot. <laughs> and uh, the next question I had, the question I had was, um, what's your take on the Fermi paradox, given what you studied? I think that the, uh, the Fermi paradox, there's good basis for how we're not seeing them um, because so we've been now working, now, we now have a model for how life can start on a rocky world with some liquid water, which we, we think is the only place it can start. But then we find to our horror that liquid water on the surface of a rocky planet is a freakishly rare thing. And that Mars, for example, uh, lost its oceans early on. Uh, and Natalie Cabral says within 400 million years, because the atmosphere was stripped away, there's no magnetic field. Venus, the oceans, went into the atmosphere, became a hothouse. Earth held liquid water in substantial quantity for four billion years, just by happenstance. This is not going to be, this is going to be an extraordinarily rare thing. And it's probably because our moon is so perfectly sized and positioned that it has just, there's just been a critical factor. So in the trillions of exoplanets, probably 99% of them go out of habitability. Uh, they might have some microbial community that's now in the rocks. That's what we'll look for on Mars. We've got to look on, under the rocks. So I think that life could get started, but the conditions for life to start, so the Earth today or 100 or 500 million years ago is, it was extraordinary. It was liquid oceans, active volcanism, active plate tectonics, which should have stalled out so long ago. And the films of microbial communities were not powerful enough to manage the temperature or gas content yet. That's what Baldock calls Gaia. And I think most worlds never reach. They just stall out. It's an extraordinarily rare thing. Thanks. Um, thank you for that and for your talk this morning. Just amazing. Um, I was struck by your use of Dick Schwartz's internal family systems model. And I was curious if you had been exposed to the notion of guides in that model, mm -hmm. and if that was something that you were connecting to the field in any way, and perhaps even the Akashic Records. Yeah, I think I talked to Ralph Abraham a lot about some of these things. He wrote a book about the Akashic Records. I think it's all kind of the same thing, maybe. Um, but it's very personal. So when we read about it, and, and it seems distant, but then we walk outside and some amazing thing happens. What I did in order to develop a skill, this is about page 11, I didn't share this this morning. I said, okay, there seems to be two ways to operate in the world for an 11 year old, which is, one is get in my head and get worried about getting things done, which is what all society wants me to do. The second is a different way. You feel something here and you just move around. So I would leave the house in, in Kamloops with the goal of giving a baseball back to a boy that I just met. And I, I, I would load a different, I would load the operating system of plan A, which is I'm worried that I have to find this boy and give him a ball or I'm going to be in trouble. And I would never find the boy. Then I would go back to the house, I would reset my system and go with plan B, which is intuitive intuitive guy. It could be like a guy. And I would just be moved all over the place. Crazy adventures would happen. It's not like the hobbits on their weird quest. In and out, just in and out, and then I would see the boy in the field, and he waved to me. And it was the perfect moment that the synchronous field set up for that, to get the job done. It was smarter than me, I realized at 11, there's something that's smarter than me. I'll go with plan B, because it's going to work out better. So that's been the story of my life. 
So I understand that uh, you have something to do with uh, chronicling Terrence McKenna's work and thought. And Rupert likes to quote him saying, just give me one miracle and the rest is easy. <laughs> uh, so I was trying really carefully to see, because since I'm, I've tended to lean towards the idea that consciousness is not emergent from physical matter, it's primary. And so, but you're having an emerge, emerge with life and I was trying to, to see where I am this could start showing up. And the closest I could see in the PIM model was memory. And I'm curious if you could just expand on what you think memory is and, and what, where it's stored, how it, you know, it could be an Akashic record question. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good one. And, and actually, you are right now initiating the inquiry. Yes. I've never even thought about this. And it's your inquiry maybe to do That's this. true. Come see my poster. I will. Yeah, we, we got a lot to talk about. <laughs> when you said rhythm, it's all about rhythm. That's what my poster's all about. Okay. Well, you know, um, so in the beginning, in the beginning, I sound like some white-haired guy, <laughs> staff, Gandalf, right? <laughs> More fun than God. But uh, anyway, uh, so in the beginning, genetic polymers, which is what we're doing in the lab now, so we literally throw in short pieces of DNA, we melt them with hot water, we template and we pop off RNA as the first expression. And that's probably what happened. We're doing it to create a therapeutic, to, to shut down all viral action, which is going to be pretty cool if we can do this. Um, but that's a strict memory, physical memory. But then there be, memory goes more diffuse. Memory goes into something called uh, niche construction. And this I just came from a conference in Cambridge all about the extended evolutionary synthesis. Niche construction is where the environment itself memory, has a memory of things outside of genes. And it's a new thing in evolutionary biology that the niches, you know, whether it be a blob of protocells or a beaver den, are a memory system and they transfer between generations. So that's when memory starts to go away from specific on-offs. And I think it happened in human culture that way too. We, we started with lots of on-offs. Um, written language or specific, we, we would memory, memorize patterns in animal calls in our brains and we were, there were distinct units. And then through culture, it became distributed in a way that we're only just now seeing. So for example, in Luminous, uh, in a couple of our modules, we'll do lineage work. And so it's 100 people in one room entering a fantastically high energetic state without being high. <laughs> so you don't have the crutch of medicines. It's just human. It's like a holy roller church service or a good rock concert. Everybody can feel it, right? It's pretty common. But we do it for healing. And so then there's this flowing energy that's intelligent, that's moving people around the room, and it positions you everywhere. But that intelligence is also passing stuff around. We just rely upon it. So when we come to someone who's undergoing a cathartic release, for example, say through a trauma release, we're doing a big massive trauma release as a group, you just, like for me, my system, I'll come to them and I'll look in their eyes and I'll get the entire download. They were running through their neighborhood and young boys came around them and didn't beat them up but started to shout at them. So they have this response. They're constantly doing this and their shoulders are this way from that one and one event. And I'll start to describe that. I'll really kind of get out of the way and let it come through me and I'll describe that event which they've not shared with anyone. And then boom. So it's an Akashic record kind of thing. We just do it all the time. You know, like, but I don't have a model for how it works, but we rely on it. It's like electrons in the 19th century. Like, they used them everywhere, but there was no model for electrons and how they work. So perhaps you know, we can exquisitely rely on that on a big, mass network memory system that is just conserve our needs all the time. We don't have to explain it yet. Maybe. Yeah how it physically works. But it just, it somehow works. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Um, so earlier... A Sorry, it's a low for you. Yeah, this is a, people. What's wrong with this low mic here, right? <laughs> right, yeah. Um, earlier, you, you showed the screens where the people were hypnotized to watching and talked about the serpent. And then the other side of the equation seems to be um, 
connecting with the inner guide, the, the damaged part of us, or the traumatized part. And uh, it seems like the serpent is winning <laughs> in terms of, uh, I mean, aside from a group like this, mm -hmm. there's a lot of attention on distraction and everything else, but going inside and being vulnerable and being with the truth. Do you have a sense of how we could uh, kind of upscale that? Or? I think that what's happening in Rosma, who's here in the front row, is the avatar of her generation, the so-called millennials, <laughs> who were raised on smartphones. I guess the iGems are the smartphone ones. Yeah. But when I watch Rosma's work, her healing modalities, mm -hmm. and the way that she operates and the way her generation operates, they're at an upscale evolution. They are as present as, as us old, old people that were raised on PCs or phones or something. They're running at a faster pace. Like the, their systems are evolved, so they'll communicate quicker in shorter bites, but they'll get places even faster than we will. They're not ponderous. They're just ch -ch -ch -ch, they're synchronized a lot more. Mm -hmm. And so some of them may be a little trashed by too much social media as it's an addiction thing. But then their practices to pop people out of that back into their bodies are more powerful than we've ever used. And so they are, if you think of a serpent coiling around that wonderful silver spire of evolution, squeezing it down, they're popping out the top. They're saying, we're adapting, we're evolving, we're just responding because that's what we do. So the serpent is, is an evolutionary mechanism. If it squeezes too tight, it's going to choke us. But as long as we, we are aware of it, there you are, I see you, you little serpent second off in the thing. Or, uh, also, millennials are amazing in that they'll look at someone like current politicians or people who are acting out, and they'll go, yeah, right. Because they already know about trauma. They already know about process. They're really dialed into that. It's not a mystery to them. They already have self-awareness about their own system. They're more exquisitely attuned than, than my generation was. So they can call out the groups that are kind of a little crazy and ignore it, actually, frankly, and build a different world. Mm -hmm. I think. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I think I hear lunch people, so maybe two more questions. Um. Well, as a citizen scientist, I find the biggest challenge is weeding through uh, the fake news, if you will. Um, so, you know, for example, uh, a space group from Japan did some asteroid mining a week or so ago. I'm reading some articles that say that the, it's sea type, they're finding carbon stuff in that asteroid, and then others are saying nope, and then it's like, okay, well, I'm hearing this, I'm hearing this. What would you recommend for you know, citizen scientists to get the most accurate information um, is question one. And question two is, are all of the space archaeologists of the world united and collaborating on all of this joint work? I think it, it goes back to, so all of us are, have high intelligence in terms of message and story. So if we look at this stuff, pretty much everybody has these fake stories, they go off the rails at some point. Unless we're, we have a strong attachment to have some need met, we go, yeah, right. And I think we need to train our young people and ourselves to be almost like samurai, like block that one, you know, question anyone proposing stuff. So I was raised in Canada, which is a lot like Scandinavia. And, and really the ethos of Canada is skepticism. And we look at America as like, oh my God, look at the things that these people do, and the things that they believe and the things that they allow in their society. And it's sort of a horror, but also a, a graveyard fascination as we sit in our lawn chairs at the border and like, they just deregulated the mortgage market. This should be interesting. <laughs> or they're doing this crazy thing. You know, it's, the United States is the, is the laboratory rat maze of countries, right? It's not really a country at all. It's a set of emergent phenomena and pushing and shoving and rats moving around. And something. It's just no plan for the place. So the U.S. is a pretty unique thing, but it has all the brilliance and genius and everything. All the other countries are stodgy compared to this one. And uh, so, but Americans are very gullible. For some reason, the last 50 years, have gotten super gullible. I have no idea. Too many sugar pop cereals or too, something happened. 
but then they're malleable, so they'll create all these fantastic ventures. But we have to care for them. We have to not let them be abused. And so they're being subject to tremendous abuse right now with all this negative storytelling. But I just don't watch any I pay no attention to it. But other people are very, you know, they're traumatized by the latest pronouncement, the latest conspiracy theory, and I can see them going through roles of trauma. And perhaps we need a legal framework of liability. You know, cigarette companies were liable for, you know, cigarette, that's what sort of shut down, that's what scared them off. Perhaps those promulgating fake news should be liable for the consequences, the mental health consequences mm -hmm. of doing this and, ha and held accountable um, somehow. You know, you know, how do you do that? But, but really they are liable for damages actually mm -hmm. to society, especially for certain types of things. Creating riots, people die, things like that. It should be liable. Thank you. And the second part are scientists from um, the world, you know, collaborating on the space archaeology missions that are going on right now. Space archaeology. Yeah. I don't know what that is. Well, um, space archaeology, you know, is as a citizen scientist, I'm looking at sites and it's like figuring out where looting is going on. But you know, on the asteroid level, like Japan just went out and they're yeah, they're mining, too, they're yeah. mining the asteroids. So yeah, sampling, and then in NASA is working Bennu, I believe is the asteroid that we're orbiting right now. So, is NASA talking to Japan, that's talking not to you? Archaeology, that's a sample return. Ah, uh, okay. So there's okay. no civilizations to find. Yes, thank but, you for yeah, that. they're closely collaborating. I've been at several meetings, and it's fantastic. It's fantastic. They have instruments on each other's missions. Okay, good. good. Yeah, no, it's it's a great effort. Really, okay. Really good. Excellent. I'll have to connect more on, on yeah. that global level. Thank you. We have one more question here. To the oh, I just saying thank you on the behalf of the next generations. I'm a, I'm a school teacher. I have been teaching bilingual to the kids who just came to the country. So I'm doing English immersion, and I taught them a, a lesson about the seasons and the planets and um, revolution and evolution and all like that. So some kids pick that up, and pretty soon they're back at the computer looking at finding, you know, looking for this information. So I'm just wondering. How do children find out about what you're doing so that that's the next generation? How can they uh, follow this and start on their careers? Well, hopefully, there's a whole bunch of YouTube videos on this. And we do a lot of animation, as you can see here. Mm -hmm. And we need help to like, make funky, fun, narrated animations. But we have a great couple of artists that do all this work. It's short YouTube video pieces on all this. There's a bunch of you just Google my name. I have a podcast. I'm on lots of podcasts. Deepak and I did a Facebook Live thing that was super fun. Mm -hmm. So that reached like two or three hundred thousand people. So that's how I'm trying to to do this thing, and hopefully there's good recordings from here. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I could use I could certainly use help in creating the outreach material. I'm sure I'm sure a lot of teachers will be interested in because our kids they care about this. They don't want to hear the stuff that's old. It's old, right? It's all it's already cracking, desiccated, turning yeah. into. And I, I taught kindergarten for a while uh -huh. in Salinas Valley, uh, just with a friend of mine, and they were all farm worker kids. They were so smart mm -hmm. because, and they were so committed to that kindergarten because that was the only place they could get lunch because their families mm -hmm. didn't have enough food. But they were as smart and as they were beautiful kids, super polite. And um, they had a weird ex mixture of Spanish and English all the time. Mm -hmm. Everything was always blended. So I did like science things for them and as kindergartners. All kids are the same brilliant geniuses connected to the field. Um, yeah, I don't want to hold you up, but um, I'm working on curriculum, new curriculum, mostly for uh, gifted education in high school. So I welcome any collaborations subsequently. But I wanted to also make you aware that some of what I was watching was a review for me on material I've been learning as an attorney, working with brilliant minds, one of them being someone who uh, studied under two Nobel Prize winners on, on uh, the autonomic nervous system. He's an autopoiesis expert. So we've been looking at what are the conditions which 
are within our control, which we can create and upregulate or downregulate, whether to enhance life and healing or to to take yeah. it down. And he's got all kinds of slides in detail, and I don't know if it duplicates what you're doing, but he's a global luminary for ions. But he's never presented here. Really? Okay. Yeah, and another thing was to, I just sat through a presentation on another, um, we have very quietly, Michigan is very conservative, and my daughter and I come to California just to kind of yeah. break out and reconnect with everybody. But she's from Illinois and yeah. brother. I just made this for Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we're everywhere. We, um, we just um, very quietly um, in a different arena in Michigan, the same concepts you were talking about, about releasing, we're working with that um, in a healing environment. Um, and I'm able to do some of the connect the dot with the work I do as an attorney with mental health hospitals and also working in hospitals. And it's just, it's, everybody is just astounded at what little bit we've already worked with it and seen results similar, it sounds like, to what you're doing. It's amazing. It, 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 yeah, but in, in, in people not really understanding it, but people trying to connect about it is just outstanding. So anyway, uh, yeah, follow-up will be fabulous. Yeah, let's connect. Her, yeah. her mom and dad and all our parents, right? The parents of the millennials are learning a lot fast. Yeah. It's exciting. No, it's comfortable. Oh, yes, I will take that. Like yes. yes. Uh, thank so you. What's your name? Plasma. Plasma. Hi, Plasma. Yes. 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 I'm a, like 68 years old. I just want to, I don't want to quit teaching because I just want to make sure that the children get some of this information.